Thank you, Sean, uh, for this great talk, as always. Also, great paper, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're unbiased. Uh, okay. Um, let me start uh, with a second in, with a question um, to Dr. Lezapon. Um, so, this is a question from Christian. Uh, do you think that some of the negative health impact of Privatella in low fiber diets um, might be due to Privatella compromising the intestinal mucosa? You touched on that a little bit, uh, but using it as a carbon source, uh, maybe in conjugation with other taxa. I've seen at least one one paper kind of suggesting, you know, that Privatella through mucin degradation, you know, like I've seen people suggest that, um, but I I feel like I've seen a whole lot more papers on bacteroides, like certain ones, you know, like also, you know, metabolizing host mucins. And so I think that's actually, you know, kind of a complicated question. Like, you know, there's really, in terms of their biology, no reason to think like, oh, Prevotella really degrades the mucins and bacteroides don't touch it. I would almost think it's the, the opposite. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That makes sense. Uh, the next question would be to both speakers. Um, is also from Christian. And um, how do you think, uh, how conserved do you think are the association between the enterotypes that both of you mentioned across the different communities with different lifestyles and cultures? So do you think uh, it will hold up with communities that are also, that are, contain uh, underrepresented populations? Yeah. Kathy, you want to start? I feel like you're better. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, uh, that's a great, great question. I, I do. I think there's a lot of reason to believe they, that they won't be super consistent, you know, because um, I was kind of running out of time at the end. So I rushed through them, but, you know, like there has been work done, even just comparing like the private tele species sort of complex and what, you know, in, in, in agrarian cultures versus the U.S. and even within the U.S. with, you know, vegetarian, vegan, and, um, and omnivorous, you know, diets and the Prevotella, um, you know, are very, are very different in terms of their genome content and their, you know, um, their carbohydrate utilization gene clusters. And so I don't, and I, I really think, I don't think, I I really wish I did this earlier. I'm finally like getting shotgun meta genomes on Prevotella rich MSM, but you know, like just that they the Prevotella don't colonize mice when they do when from non-MSM. Like I do think there's a lot of biological difference there. I don't in the beginning I was really trying to relate what we saw to all the literature on Prevotella. And the more I learn, I, I I almost feel like we're just dealing with a different animal. You know what I mean? It's not, you know, and and so I um so I I don't really think I think the reason some of our my initial hypotheses turned out to not pan out was because it's a, it's just a different, it's a it's different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean that's part of the reason we, we wanted to have this session is like it's it's just constantly intriguing to me how how crazy Prevotella is, all these varying associations in different directions and I'm trying to understand how how it works. Uh, I think it's just such an exciting place to to look right now. Um, <clears throat> from the enterotype, ter sorry, in the enterotype side of things, that's they're often um, kind of calculated at at sort of like a 16s sequencing level, like genus or species level. Um, and you know, if we go back to like the data we had in our course the last couple of days, we looked at the hots and a few other populations. Um, you know, you look at the stacked bar plot of, of the abundances of different genera in those samples, and it's like, it looks like a completely equal distribution of all the time. Like, it's, there's no one taxa dominating. It's just super, super diverse. Um, if you try to run these clustering algorithms, um, like uh, the Dirichlet multinomial mixture model thing, on these samples, uh, you don't get four clusters. <laughs> you just don't. Uh, if, you look, if you look beyond Europe and the U.S., the, the story becomes just an infinitely more complicated. I, I do, I was a little grumpy about enterotypes early on in my career, but I, I kind of believe it for like America and Europe that you can kind of squint and, and lump people into these four categories-ish. But when you look beyond that, it's it doesn't look to be the case. Um, and so I, may, I might ask the next question if you don't mind, Noah. Go ahead. Because um, it kind of, I think, tips off from this, like what it, 
you know, what's going on here and what, what are the functional um, sort of relationships here. But Kathy, I, I might have missed it in your talk. Did you see so you, you took um, fecal material from men who have sex with men uh, and and incubated that with, with like immune cells to look at look at responses? Did you did you grab high prevotella folks who were non MSM and do the same experiment? Yeah, you did. Yeah, we. I mean, we had we only had a couple prevotella tell folks who are non MSM, you know, so they were, they would have been included. We didn't exclude them, but I just, we didn't really have the power to just take the non, -M, you know, non MSM. Cause it was only, only just a couple, but yeah, like right now we were just looking at that. How many are, because we were for the shotgun we're currently doing, I was trying to get to some people in our hands who were non MSM it's just to, you know, even, you know, have that. And yeah, it's just, it's just like, it's just a couple people. So <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah. Um, I can, I'll jump in again while you look. Um, okay. Uh, but another question I had, Kathy, was, um, you know, this, the fact that you didn't see a similar effect for women who were having anal intercourse, like, that's like mind blowing, right? Like, what is the yeah. behavior driving this? And did you take more detailed behavioral information from folks about sexual behaviors? Um, we you, did. You did? We expanded the questionnaire a little bit, you know what I mean? And like, um, just to ask about particular things, like there's actually one paper um, out from uh, Colleen Kelly's lab where she actually in a very controlled way had men use a type of lubricant that she thought was going to be particularly destructive to the gut, like a, a hyperosmolar like lubricant. And like, she did see some changes kind of in that direction with that, that lubricant, but it just, for me, I just can't explain it all because unless people are not being honest, you know, there's just men who are like, I'm always only the insertive partner. That's what they're saying, but they have this microbiome. So then actually I noticed someone else was the question, like, can you do strain tracking? Maybe something's driving it, but then, you know, you share part, there's been stuff a lot done with heterosexual couples showing, you know, you share microbes with the people you are intimate with and it could be like something's driving it and then <laughs> and then it gets sort of passed, you know, because yeah, it, it really just that just that someone who is engages in anal intercourse but never is receptive, it just throws away anything you think of, like, you know, like like do you use an enema before? You know, there's all these things that you think maybe that's it, but it's like, but all of them are more associated with with the um the receptive partner, you know? So yeah, so it's, it's been really hard to figure out. And, and I don't actually think that it's like our sexual behavior data is that poor because we found other reasonable things to correlate with sexual behaviors. You know, like we've seen, you know, like some, um, some other pathogens that could be, you know, uh, passed, you know, to those to correlate with people who are, you know, reporting more high risk behaviors, but the Prevotel is honestly just so prevalent that there's just not one any single thing that, that all of them are, do, you know what I mean? Everyone with that are doing, you know, it's like most, most of the cohort has that, you know, uh, that microbiome type. So I'd, I'd love to see a detailed strain tracking study with sexual partners. I know there was, I think Murat Aaron had something with like penis and vagina microbiomes and looking at um, transmission, uh, but I, I think like looking at more diverse sexual behaviors and transmission would be would be interesting. I suspect as, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of of sexual behaviors, but as an MSM myself, you know, I I, I suspect there's potentially more fecal oral transmission opportunities in in MSM behaviors. Um, and some work I've seen suggests to me that Prevotella might be actually really um, I don't know what the word is, maybe contagious, <laughs> but yeah. uh, it, it's, if it gets transmitted anaerobically, so to speak, or, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to travel very far between people um, and it gets into a new system, it seems to be pretty good at taking root. There was a study I saw in New Zealand where they gave, they had like competitive FMTs where they took donor material from five people and they mixed it together and then they gave it to a bunch of recipients. And one of the five donors was high Prevotella every one of the recipients, I prevotella after the, after the FMT. Yeah. So I, I wonder if it's just like one of those things that gets in and just like dominates. 
and you know we've, we've actually we have tried to write the um we have written great unfunded grants to look at all these things um that uh but we were um kind of thinking about the same things you're thinking about that it could be spread and looking at that and we also just kind of you know we wanted to look at MSM who were not high risk you know this isn't all MSM you know like that we're looking at it's a very it's a very select group and you know and then also kind of and that, you know it'd be hard to recruit but like younger MSM newly sexually active you know <laughs> because you you know if that's true it's just what you would expect that they would less you know that it just gets acquired over time the longer you're an MSM you just pick this microbiome up from from your community teenagers, <laughs> yeah. teenagers before they're sexually act active and watch them over time and see if you just see a flip in in the MSM. Yeah. that'd be really cool that would be interesting but no one wanted to fund that no <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Sean, I have a question here from Javad Sadegi, and he's asking, uh, is the statin metabolism starts in the intestine, and can statin change saliva microbiome? Uh, good question, Javad. Um, you know, statins are often in pill form, and so they I, I doubt they're dissolving already in the mouth, but maybe a little bit. Um, I'm guessing a, a large amount of the statin drug is absorbed in the small intestine before it even reaches the, the colon, right? So um, how much the, the colonic microbiota are affecting the levels of the drug that's absorbed is, is kind of up in the air because maybe almost all of it's absorbed in the small intestine. However, when we look at stool and use metabolomics, we can see statin showing up in poop. <clears throat> and if we... Um, run ex vivo incubations, we can actually watch that statin be degraded by, by the microbiota. So we know that it's there at appreciable levels. We know that the microbes are still munching on it, even after it comes out in, in stool. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's hard to say how much of, how much of the actual microbial metabolism of statin is affecting its efficacy in vivo versus maybe it's some really indirect thing going on. Like maybe it has more to do with bile acid synthesis and that's being indirectly shifted around by the microbes um and it's not ha having anything to do at all with actually metabolizing the drug um we're, we're we're trying to figure it out actually it's it's a it's kind of a quandary sorry can i click ask a quick that builds on that but like have you looked like in your ex vivo like what the statin is being turned into and then you know and then you can get that spectrum of things and screen whether that's correlating especially with some of those you know, you said you're back to a more like comorbidities, you know, where there are particular metabolites of the statins that you could track and see if that's driving it. Great question. Um, and we're going to soon be, Christian just got a grant to, to do more ex vivos with statins. And I know is involved in that as well. Um, but in the past, we've used Metabolon, <clears throat> which is a commercial company. Um, and you get a really large set of annotated features from Metabolon. I think they, you know, larger than you can get anywhere else, essentially. Uh, but the downside of using Metabolon is um, they don't give you the raw data, uh, the MSMS spectra. So it's hard to discover novel things that you didn't know were there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, we, we've started working a bit with Peter Dorstein. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that would be really cool to try to um, do some deeper de novo um, annotations of, of these downstream metabolites that are coming out from de degradation, degradation of statins. Yeah, it's a good idea. Cool. Sean, um, so we have a question here from Camilo Gomez Garzon that I will rephrase a little bit. So he's asking about whether the same work, such as the one you described, was done from for type 2 diabetes drugs, such as metmorphin, that can sometimes cause... Um, stomach discomfort, which may um, come from the microbiome. And also, if you can talk about some of the ways you're taking this work uh, to um, ways that we can engineer maybe the gut microbiome to alleviate those uh, metabolic side effects. Great question. Um, let's see, metformin. Yeah, actually. So actually, there's a lot of studies on metformin just because, well, A, I think it makes sense that it would be associated with the microbiome to some extent because it's involved in metabolism and, and diabetes and, the, and absorbed in the gut. 
Um, so there are several studies on that. Um, actually, I know Christian Diener had a study a while back from his prior lab where they were looking at treatment naive, so people not on metformin versus people taking metformin and type 2 diabetes and how that might the microbiome was affected by all of that. Um, and I know that there are studies in vitro showing that microbes can, can eat metformin essentially or degrade it. Um, so for sure, there, there's a and statins again is one of the reasons we study statins is is you know we had these big sort of untargeted cohorts that had been recruited and if you want to find you know roll the dice for what drug is the most used in these cohorts that we have the most data for and the most power to investigate well statins right like most it's the most used drug in in the u.s so that was the one that was the easiest to to go after um how are we using this and how, how might we engineer it uh, in the future so we get some insight for what might be going on, on the, for the on-target on side and the off-target side that could help us with precision drug treatment. Um, so on the on-target side, we find that people who um, have lower efficacy of a, of a statin uh, have lower LDL lowering, less LDL lowering, so to speak. Um, they um, are depleted in, in, I think, bacteroides and we see a strong association between bacteroides and blood levels of ursodeoxycholate, which is a bile acid. And it's been associated previously with lowering LDL cholesterol. I think there are some people who take it actually as a way to lower your LDL. There's a cool study from the Sonnenberg lab that showed if you ate l xylan which is a dietary fiber, you could actually boost the level of ursodeoxycholate in, in your blood. Um, so that could be a means by which you have a co-therapy where if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're taking a statin, you're not bringing your LDL as down as, as much as you want, you could maybe supplement with arabinazilin or directly supplement with ursodeoxycholate and try to even further pull down your LDL. On the metabolic perturbation side of things, we notice that people who have the biggest disruption of their metabolism tend to be depleted in butyrate producing clostridia and acromancia mucinophila. Uh, and so, there's a, there's a reasonable approach there where you could apply it, probiotics potentially to help shield people from the metabolic effects of the statin. So I know Acromancia mucinophila now is on the market. I think Pendulum is a company in the US and there's a company in Europe called the Acromancia company and you can now buy it and give it to people. Uh, so I, I could imagine having a statin as a baseline treatment and then supplementing it with co-therapies that try to um, you know, guide the, the response of an individual person based on their microbiome. Thank you, Sean. Um, actually, just a piggyback question to that. So do you see a way one day where engineering the microbiome could directly lead to lowering LDL levels without statins? I mean, I think that's, I think a lot of people try lifestyle uh, interventions before try, going on to a drug. And, you know, one thing that's been done a lot is is five dietary fiber like like arabinazilin or metamucil and these things have been shown to, to bring down your ldl so you can you can budget um but maybe you aren't bringing it down enough for the for your cardiologist to be happy so i definitely follow your cardiologist's advice there um there's also um a supplement out there it's called like red yeast rice or something uh, and this is like a yeast that's been fermented with a uh, sorry a rice that's been fermented with a yeast and that that fungus actually, um, if you if you did metabolomics on it, it would be full of levastatin, right? It, it's actually the I think it's one of the organisms that the drug was originally isolated from, and people take it as like a a non drug therapy, but in, in a sense they are taking the drug. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'd say. Awesome. So this is a question from Doug, I think to you, Catherine is uh, might quorum sensing in bacteria be responsible for some of the inconsistencies in the different roles of uh, Prevotella? Um, so by quorum sensing, do you mean just- I, I think mean, it's communication between- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just trying to think like, I mean, if there's different, um, I mean, there's a, there's very different community types you know it's sort of like there's just this very dominant like prevotella so numerically dominant but there 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 is just so many different microbes that correlate you know like these you know with the prevotella or with the bacteroides you know in these different in these different contexts and we did we did in our um in our 
paper where we were describing the prevotella rich microbiomes in MSM kind of actually do an analysis where we were looking at whether there was differences in co-occurrence patterns in MSM versus non-germs, you know, like what other types of bacteria, you know, they, um, they correlated with in those different, you know, contexts. And there were, there were unique patterns there. So, you know, I, I can kind of see that there's, there's things that are kind of related to, um, to context, you know, on the community level and, you know, how that could, that could definitely be, be going on. Um, um actually can i ask can I yes. a question go ahead um there's there are these papers out of denmark i believe jorth at all right where they show that high prevotella microbiomes um help you you tend to be able to lose more weight on a high fiber diet mm. um do you have you seen any evidence for that in um in your MSM cohorts, like are, are these folks more, if, if they switch up their diets towards a healthier diet, are they better able to lose weight than the average individual? You know, we are actually, we, we're doing those studies. So we actually are doing diet interventions. And when we got the grant, we didn't know it was M MSM. You know, we were like, okay, we're gonna have HIV negative and positive. And that's when we started using the MSM uh, controls. And then we realized, oh shoot, like our, test and our control population are both Prevotella rich. So we added a third cohort where we have, uh, you know, HIV positive and negative MSM and non-MSM. And we did, yeah, we did an intervention. Actually it was pretty dramatic. Like we, we gave them fiber, fat, sodium totals that were like the same as an agrarian diet or we gave them like a Western diet. But our outcome, they were actually non-obese. Our outcome was, um, we, we were, looking at both metabolic um, health markers. So like, uh, you know, uh, LDL, HDL, um, fasting, um, fasting blood glucose, insulin, and, you know, and those things were actually elevated in our HIV positive, you know, so correctable more so than our HIV negative. And then, and then we were looking at, you know, inflammation like um, IL-6 and CRP, you know, and it was part of that whole hypothesis we had of like, matching like okay you have a prevotella rich microbiome no matter what you eat so um and if a high fiber diet is like especially beneficial if you have a prevotella rich microbiome and we were saying in terms of your metabolic health because there's papers on that with glucose tolerance so you know rather than trying to modify the microbiome was like you should eat what your microbiome is like because you know like there's matching that happens and not and then there is and so we're still crunching on that data but you know i would say um you know, at this point, I'm not seeing like, we, we're seeing like, like a lot of differences in HDL, like with the diet, but it doesn't differ if you're like, in one cohort or the other, you know, what I mean, and, and, you know, so, and the inflammation is like borderline so it's like almost significant, you know? <laughs> but, but not quite, but you know, but again, we kind of see it in or to be positive, but they're the only ones who are like, ele you know, elevated to the start. And it's like, they're all Prevotella rich. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you know, I, yeah, we've been having trouble kind of seem like a clever idea, but I, I'm like, so far it's not, not like, you know, overly impressed. And like the, the, and again, we're still crunching on the data, but the thing we have seen, you know, correlates more with Bacteroides than Prevotella. And it kind of brings up to, you know, when you see these, Correlates is it presence of is it presence of Prevotella or lack of Bacteroides? You know, what I mean that's that's really kind of driving what you see because they do seem to trade off with each other. And right. you know those mouse experiments I showed where they gavage the Prevotella in the Bacteroides goes down. And yeah, I don't know they're all relative abundances, so who knows? But it does it does seem to be you know kind of niche competition going there. And you know, um, yeah, and, and there's there's this evidence you add bacteroides and there's beneficial, you know, influences for obesity and in the context of a high fat diet. So is, is that what's driving it or, you know, <laughs> but yeah, the, the effect amplifier of either a good or a bad diet, right? It's bad when it's, when it's bad and it's better when it's good. <laughs> like uh, yeah, yeah, I, I do think there is like, I do think, you know, just based on all the literature I've read that it's like, if you're eating a high fat diet, there's just a lot of evidence to me that bacteroides are actually kind of 
more protective in that context. And Prevotel can be detrimental because they can make like TMAO more, you know, that enterotype. But if you're eating a high fiber diet, then the Prevotella shows health benefits. So it's really context specific, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, the question is, is it is it context specific or is it strain specific? And we just don't have the resolution to look at that. So if you had HIV positive individual that consume high fiber diets, uh, what would be the effect of Prevotella then? I don't know if, if you've looked at that. Could you have then conflicting effects of different strains of Privatella? Yeah, I and mean, we have we have definitely not looked at the strain level. Although we we are we I, you know like at this point you know I just have hints of it because when we look at our 16S data, there's a lot of different Privatella um, ASVs even you know amplicon sequence variants, and we can see like most of them go up in MSM, but there's one that goes down. You know, so like there's some some evidence you know from that but we just haven't done the shaka metagenome with it yet and we're going we're doing it now but i you know i think that will be revealing and it, it'll be it'd be interesting to kind of relate it to the privatella copy clusters that have already been defined you know um but then see if there's just not novel ones too and you know whether they actually you know the the papers done so far they they kind of differentiate across like their carbohydrate utilization genes, but they're looking at people differentiated across diets. You know, in this case, the strains might be differentiated, but it, I would expect is it more like differentiated along genes that, you know, tolerate inflammation or, you know, like, or things like that. And, you know, because I, I just, I don't see any evidence that the Prevotella enterotype in men sex with men has anything to do with diet. I mean, we've looked at that with, and, you know, we haven't seen any any evidence of diet diet as a driver. We don't yeah, know that. I, I think I remember you presenting on this a while back. Didn't you say that um, some of the MSN actually had higher meat diets? They actually, on average, did. Yeah, so it was like the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have another um, futuristic question for you, uh, Dr. Lazarpon, from an anonymous uh, mm -hmm. participant, uh, do you think that your studies can help prevent HIV transmission or infection? And if yes, how could the microbiome modifications be a strategy? Yeah, I mean, in theory, yes, because, you know, we have evidence that um, the microbiome of MSM is influencing the um, expression of HIV co-receptor CCR5 and you know CCR5 I've already heard that's the one that the couple of people have been cured of HIV was they did a stem cell transplant and they put in CD4 T cells that didn't have CCR5 it's like essential and if the microbiome is upping the CCR5 then modifying it you know in theory could could help prevent it so you know but then that gets down to problem in every study how do you, how do you modify a microbiome you know like you know that you're like I mean, I think understand, I, I think there's one of the things is just understanding what drives that microbiome type is important because then you could, you know, go after the drivers. But if you're just going to say this is the microbiome type and we want to prevent it, you know, I really think why that's why we're trying to get more of the mechanism, like, you know, with taking out particular microbes and looking at strain level variation, you know, I'd love to just kind of better understand it. Well, it's this compound that this microbe makes that's interacting, you know, with this, you know, that's inducing the CCR5. And, you know, then you can, then you target not a microbe, you know, which right now with any disease, you just kill everything, right? <laughs> like antibiotics, like, you know, like I think you can more target, you know, pathways, you know, um, I like I like the type of work I've seen Stan Hazen go with TMAO. We're gonna just try to make the microbes not make it. We're not gonna try, you know, <laughs> but you need that mechanistic understanding um, to to do that sort of thing. So um Sean, uh, that's a question from from uh, Richard Sprug. And he's asking how much diet information uh, did you have about statin users? Could it be that you know some of them have had low carb diet, increased LDL level, and did you take into account that? Good question. Um, we really didn't have much dietary information, sadly, for this particular cohort. Um, we did our best to 
control for as many uh, uh, covariates as we could, you know, so we of course control for, you know, things like sex and age, BMI. Um, <clears throat> for a lot of our analyses, we were even controlling for things like type two diabetes um, and um, in other drug usage. Uh, but yeah, we don't, we don't quite know what the dietary intake is for those folks. You know, you can guess that people <clears throat> who are in like the back two enterotype, for example, in prior studies, it's been shown that those folks are often the people who are on lower fiber diets. Um, so you might be able to infer something about diet based on composition, but technically we didn't have that data for that for that for that data set. Although, let's see, we had a validation data set from Europe, Metacardis. And we did not have data there. We didn't so have yet. Data. We didn't have diet data. Um, we have metagenomics though, and you know we've thought a little bit about trying to infer um, some dietary information from metagenomes because there's some amount of um, DNA from plants and animals in our poop. It's like three to four percent of all the DNA is from non-human plants and animals, as we've looked at so far. Christian's been working on this a little bit, so we don't know if that's a feasible way to to get unbiased diet estimates from from metagenomics, but um, we're we're kind of working on that right now. Okay. And I have a question for Dr. Lizapone and help me here, Sean. Um, so um, Enosh uh, Kazam is asking uh, for the carbohydrate degrading enzymes measurement in Privatella Capri and in general, uh, in addition to metagenomic data, that's only looking at the genome. Uh, what are your thoughts on the transcription or translation of these genes? And is there a needed time for frame uh, for uh, for the bacteria to acclimate uh, to the utilization of complex car carbohydrates in the diet? That's an interesting question. And yeah, I think um, yeah, like um, transcriptomics. I think in general is kind of underutilized in the microbiome field in general, and like. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I really don't, um, I don't have a good sense of, you know, transcriptionally, I think that would, you know, just be faster, you know, like that, that organisms could quickly turn on genes, you know, like just knowing how organisms act, you know, like to, you know, utilize a new, a new diet source, you know, but I have seen evidence, you know, in the literature just of like it taking some time for the right microbes, um, to just be the right microbes to get there to utilize a, you know like a new dietary substrate i mean you just see i i just seen interesting papers with things like japanese populations more likely have microbes that degrade seaweed or like you know or soy like you know they say like soy compounds are anti um cancer but it's actually microbial metabolites of them and like you actually see that effect more in populations that eat a lot of soy so you know i, I think if you never ever eat fiber and then you suddenly do it's like you know like um, unless you have microbes there that could could quickly change their transcription it's it's going to take a little time to be able to fully use utilize that or the right exposures because <laughs> i don't know to the degree to which useless microbes are left around even the, the talks we heard this morning about you know the loss of these microbes in you know in, in agrarian cultures in the western like I don't think they really definitely get kept around and there's ones we're losing you know permanently <laughs> and so I think I think um I think that's my bigger concern just you don't have the microbes at all I, I think if you have them they could probably turn on the right genes pretty quickly but that's my that's my impression <laughs> yeah um, just a final question to either of you. Um, Javad, he, he's asking uh, about how the microbiome, uh, we, we dis you discuss different things that can change the microbiome. And the question is, to what level the microbiome is robust or resilient to all these factors, drug, sexual intercourse? Uh, are there different compositions that are more resilient to your knowledge? It's good. It's a good and hard question. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy, do you want to take a first stab? Or? Um, I could take a first stab. I mean, I think, um, I, you know, I think resiliency and um, what the, the first thing that kind of comes to me is the, my thought are, are just things like, you know, does redundancy and high diversity and things like that promote, you know, resiliency to, to disturbance and Actually, some one thing you know, kind of, um, 
you know, from my own work actually that I could think of is like, you know, we actually work in some mouse models of C. diff and, you know, we find that, um, that my, like when we feed, we, it's an antibiotic model and there's been papers showing this. If you like feed your microbiome fiber, it's more resilient to the antibiotics, right? So it's sort of like, I think, a healthier microbiome that's getting everything it needs, all the food, so it can have maintain diversity and maintain redundancy is going to be, you know, more resilient to to stresses. So I, I think that's one of the major things I, I kind of think of with with that. But what do you think, Sean? <laughs> well, yeah, I'd agree. I think diversity can promote resilience, right? The microbiome is constantly getting whacked around by, you know, one day you're eating bananas, the next day you're eating tangerines and it, you know, th different things are flying out at different times. And so the more diversity you have for, of organisms that kind of can respond to those, those that variation, the, the more stable the system tends to be. Although some of our work has shown that um, you definitely see people with very high diversity microbiomes aren't, it isn't always a great thing, right? Uh, constipation is uh, actually associated with high diversity. Mm. Uh, and maybe constipation's resilient, I don't know, but it's not necessarily a good state you want to be in. Um, <laughs> In my postdoc, I did some time series analysis work, and and there we see pretty pretty strong stability, at least in terms of people who aren't experiencing any major lifestyle changes, aren't flipping their diets in a radical way, or aren't taking antibiotics. In that such situation, on month to year time scales, the microbiome looks very stable. Like the average abundance of all the taxa, even though there's fluctuations day to day, remains pretty stable. And maybe on decadal time scales, there's like a slower drift, but from like months to years, it seems it seems pretty stable over time. I've seen that too in our work. They kind of bop around their own little mean, you know. It's not, yeah. In fact, in some ways that we just use that to discount like time between samples, even as a factor, because of like there's not a directed change, like in in the like year or so time scale we were looking. At. <laughs> nice. Okay, we are out of time, and I apologize for those we have we were we've not been able to get to their question. Um, so I'd like to conclude this Q&A section and thank Dr. Gibbons and Dr. Lizapone uh, for their fascinating talk and this uh, engaging Q&A session.